So, I uh, don't know if Saul has told you, but I am uh, in Pakistan, where I've come to visit uh, my grandmother, who is very, very ill. I've come back to Pakistan this year, uh, as I do often, and something has changed. The women are wrapped up. People are afraid to, to leave their houses. The city of Lahore, where I am now, is at a standstill. And it's not for the reason that you might think. It's not because of the religious fundamentals. It's because there's an outbreak of dengue fever transmitted by mosquitoes raging across the city. So, there's a joke here full of black, black humor that says, what the religious fundamentalists haven't been able to accomplish in two decades, the mosquitoes have accomplished in two months. And so, I have to carry this stuff around with me everywhere. Can you see this? This is mosquito repellent, okay? So I have to carry this stuff around with me and slather it on everywhere, and everybody here is trying to get their hands on this stuff, because dengue fever is a bad thing. So Pakistan is what I call a functional economy. And the story I want to tell you today is about three generations of economies, functional, aspirational, and meaningful. Pakistan is a functional economy where the basic stuff of life can be in doubt. Next door to us, India is making great leaps forward. And if you've watched a Bollywood movie recently, you may have seen a great emphasis on stuff like this. Designer sunglasses. So India is becoming an aspirational economy, obsessed with the ideas of consumerism and having see what I have, see my power, look at what I can consume, look at the goodies that I'm enjoying. And we know that story, right? Because in advanced nations, we too are aspirational economies. And we're kind of stuck there, it often seems. Despite crisis after crisis, despite a sense of emptiness and meaninglessness in our lives. And so the question is, what happens next? What lies beyond aspiration? Surely, there must be more for humanity than 100,000-person organizations focused on adding blades to razors and making deodorants slightly smellier. I hope, right? So, I want to read you a quote. I want to read you a quote from this book, a couple of quotes from this book, Can Capitalism Survive? by Joseph Schumpeter, the godfather, the grandfather of innovation, right? I think that we have often gotten only half the story of innovation. And so I want to read you the opening lines of this book. Can capitalism survive? No, I do not think it can. Surprised. Now listen to what Schumpeter goes on to say. As regards economic performance, it does not follow that men are happier or even better off in the industrial society of today than they were in a medieval manor or village as regards the cultural performance, one may accept every word I have written and yet hate it. The wholesale destruction of meanings incident to it from the bottom of one's heart. Surprised even more. Now let me read you the final lines of this book. All this surface may be more important than the tendency towards another civilization that slowly works deep down below. So what has Schumpeter concluded in this book, which was in many ways kind of his, his, the, the peak accomplishment of his career? He had concluded that maybe innovation wasn't enough, maybe capitalism itself as we know it wasn't enough to, con to continue humanity's march of progress forward. And so I want to tell you my story about where I think we've been and where I think we're going. What is it that we do in this room? whether we are teachers or students or doers or thinkers. My guess is that we are practitioners and perhaps partisans of a paradigm that I call opulence. And I'll sum up opulence for you this way. More, bigger, faster, cheaper, nastier now. And I believe that if you think about it, we can trace the history of the last hundred years of economic progress through the outlines of this paradigm. From the birth of the post-war modern consumer, carefully taught to desire more, to the rise of biggie-sized meals and big-box stores, which are about bigger, 
to the rise of fast fashion and fast food, faster, to the rise of offshore, which was about cheaper, to the streamlining of global supply chains, and the formation of a new global financial system, which was about now. And so I think we are practitioners of this paradigm that I call opulence. But at the same time, I bet, like me, you are becoming ever more aware of the costs of this paradigm. Right. Some of them include dumbification, financial crisis, polarization, inequality. Those are kind of the, the indirect costs, but they're direct costs as well. China already consumes 50% of the world's iron ore, coal, cement, but it has only achieved 10% of American levels of opulence. And so the truth may be that the world cannot afford opulence, that it's time for us to take a quantum leap forward. I believe that we stand in the rubble of what I call an opulence bubble. And I believe that the future is going to be eudaimonic. Eudaimonia, the ancient Greek word for a life meaningfully well-lived. So if opulence is about more, bigger, faster, cheaper now, what is eudaimonia about? Well, I think eudaimonia is not about stuff. It's about people and, the, and people living lives that matter. I think eudaimonia might be summed up thus, fitter, smarter, tougher, closer, wiser. I think that it is not just about teaching people to desire more, to own faster, to have bigger, to upgrade now. I think it's very much about inspiring them, helping them do things, helping them attain higher and higher peaks of accomplishment, helping them become masters of themselves and authors of their own destinies. And in that way, becoming fitter, smarter, tougher, closer, and wiser. I think that is where the global economy is headed. So I think the truth is we cannot afford opulence any longer. And I think that when we go back in history and we look at the great thinkers of the past, whether they were Schumpeter or Marx or Adam Smith, many of them understood that something was deeply amiss with the way that capitalism might end up evolving. And I think we stand on the cusp of that transition now. So let me sum it up for you this way. In a first generation economy, our role is to help people in their quest for subsistence, survival in a functional economy. That's what this is, my little bottle of mosquito repellent that keeps the mosquitoes at bay. In an aspirational economy, our role is to help people in their quest for affluence, see my power, look at what I can consume. But in a meaningful economy, a eudaimonic economy, our role is to help people in their quest for significance, to live lives that matter, to have experiences that count, to become smarter, fitter, wiser, and closer, not just to accumulate more stuff. And I think the great challenge of the next decade will be building eudaimonic institutions. Everything from corporations to jobs to GDP to a new global financial architecture itself. I don't think this will happen overnight. I think it will take at least a decade, if not more. But I do think that unless we take a eudaimonic transition, a great leap into the future now, the future will continue to look like it does today. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my talk.